So hi everyone, um, good afternoon. We will begin our uh, April um, monthly meeting for the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation. Um, so I will begin by uh, trying to establish quorum. So I am gonna ask Thalia if, um, Thalia, if you can help us out and let's take attendance to establish quorum and then we'll begin the meeting. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Okay, I will start the attendance. Give me one second, please. Okay. So Leah, if you can just be a little bit um, louder, it sounds very, very far away. Oh, uh, is this better? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so to start attendance then, um, so Chair Anaya. Um, Present. Vice Chair Lane. Present. Commissioner Ag Aglipe. Commissioner Aglipe. Okay. Um, Mayor Osbury. Here. We heard yes for Ma Mayor Osbury. Okay. Um, yes. Okay, so Commissioner Aust Austin. Commissioner Austin, no, okay. Um, Commissioner Anderson. Commissioner Anderson. Commissioner Brutus. Present. Okay. Commissioner Caliento. Present. Commissioner Cooley. Present. Ex officio um, criticos. I believe um, Peter Criticos will, won't be able to join us today. Okay. Um, Commissioner De Laurentiis. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Dubo. Present. Thanks. Commissioner Espinosa. Commissioner Flores. Present. I think there's two Floreses though. Okay. Right. Um, Commissioner Sochi Flores. Present. Okay. Commissioner Freeman. Okay. Commissioner Freeman. Okay. Commissioner Guajardo. Present. Okay. Um, Alderman Haddon. Okay. Superintendent Killen. Okay. Um, Commissioner Mails. Welcome to the team, Thalia. I'm present. Thank you. Commissioner Malone. Hi, present. Also welcome. Excited you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Norrington Reeves. Commissioner Raymer. Commissioner Rice. Present and welcome to the team. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Schleiser. Schleiser, present, thank you. Sorry about that, Schleiser, thank you. No worries, thanks. Commissioner Thomas. Commissioner Yonan. Present and uh, welcome Talia. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I believe you do have quorum. We do indeed. Thank you, Talia. Um, so we'll begin uh, with public testimony. To my knowledge, no public uh, testimony um, request was submitted or no uh, written testimony was submitted. Uh, just a reminder to anybody that is listening um, to participate, um, you need to submit a request or written comments uh, 24 hours in advance uh, to 7th 
district.office at gmail.com. So just a reminder uh, to anybody that is tuning in and listening to us today. Um, so there have been um, no edits to, um, uh, to the agenda. So at this moment, we'll begin with approval of the minutes. Uh, I believe we had some technical difficulties when we were sharing some of the documents via the uh, the invite, but I just want to verify, I believe everybody was able to get a copy of the draft minutes. Um, I'll entertain a motion. Is there someone that can uh, help us out with this motion? A motion to approve the minutes. <laughs> Thank Second. you. Second. Commissioner Malone. Um, Yonan with the second. And Yonan seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Yonan. I appreciate you both. Um, uh, any questions, any edits to the minutes or discussion? Okay, hearing none, all of those in favor of approval of the minutes signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? In opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Motion passes. Uh, thank you. We'll move on to our next item on the agenda, which is the chair and vice chair updates. Uh, so um, as you all have noted, um, we have Thalia who is joining uh, the team. She would be um, going forward. She's going to be the executive assistant to the commission. Um, she will be working solely on the commission. And um, I would uh, ask Thalia to introduce herself today. Okay. So hello, everyone. Um, my name is Thalia as Commissioner Anaya has um, introduced me. I currently go to UIC. I'm a senior there studying political science as well as a minor in finance. Um, I am on the pre-law track. And yeah, it's really nice to meet every single one of you. And I hope I get to work with many of you. Thank you, Thalia. Um, I believe uh, you all have her um, email address. So if you need to get a hold of us, um, anytime you know uh, you can't make it to the meetings or need any edits to the minutes, she will be your contact person. So um, Talia, if you can just share your email address um, in the chat function so that the commissioners could uh, have it in their records. I believe they already have it, but just in case. Um, other than that, there's no other updates on my end. I think that, uh, oh, actually one more update, I apologize. So um, as of this week, the Cook County Board of Commissioners started meeting in uh, person. Um, this is due to the fact that we were in the assumption that the governor was not going to extend his uh, emergency order for uh, remote meetings. Uh, so we are still in the lookout for that. We have been advised by the secretary's office that although there is an extension of um, the emergency order by the governor, um, that there will be opportunities moving forward to post meetings in person at uh, the boardroom, which is a place that this commission has not been in in roughly about two and a half years. So we uh, are definitely going to uh, be circling back with you all. I'll work with, the, uh, with Vice Chair Lane um, to see what the next steps are, if we will be um, open to doing it in person or uh, and of course allowing for remote participation. Um, but that is something that we will keep you up uh, up to date. And of course, Dalia is going to be helping us coordinate that. So as we move forward in the next few months with our monthly meetings, I'll be sure to, uh, you know, to communicate any advancements on that end. Um, with that said, I will turn it over to our vice chair, Lane, um, if he has any updates on his end. And uh, if not, we'll begin with the presentation. Yeah, vice chair, you. Lane. Yeah, thank you, uh, Commissioner. And I, uh, very good news that we seem to be heading in the right direction uh, as far as the uh, the uh, COVID front is concerned. May it continue? I know there has been some increase in cases, but not in hospitalizations or deaths, both of which continue to move down, fortunately, thankfully. So thanks for that good news. And I would like to uh, add my welcome to Thalia to those of our colleagues here. Uh, Thalia, you are a very welcome addition to our group. And uh, for those of the commissioners who are currently uh, involved in either of the two working groups, uh, please know that Thalia will be staff for those working groups. And we're, uh, we're thrilled to have uh, staff and uh, I have every confidence that we'll take unfair advantage of you. So welcome aboard. Um, 
So yes, um, I, I, uh, Commissioner Iyer, with your permission, I, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our uh, principal uh, witness today for his uh, testimony. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, Mark Elston join us. Uh, Mark is an ordained minister who holds a uh, Master's of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary, but he also holds an MBA from the University of Wisconsin. And he has been uh, deeply involved in really leading the field in looking at underutilized church property and finding ways property might be put to better use for public good. He's also the author of a book on that very subject called We Aren't Broke, Uncovering Hidden Resources for Mission and Ministry. So uh, Mark has graciously agreed to identify some ways in which the county might help uh, repurpose uh, underutilized church property for the public good. And I think this is a very interesting and, uh, and underexplored topic that I think uh, falls neatly within the commission's uh, mission. So Mark, thanks for being with us. Uh, thanks for your thought leadership. And uh, I'll turn the uh, podium over to you. All right, thanks, Mark. Thanks for the introduction. Good to, to be with you all. Can everyone hear me okay? Just checking on that. Yep. Um, and actually, just if I can confirm if it's okay for if I speak about 25 minutes and then go from there, is that a good no, starting that's, point? That's perfect. Thank you. And undoubtedly, Great. the commissioners will have some questions and follow ups thereafter. Great. Just want to make sure I'm not <laughs> going way beyond. I'm a, I'm a preacher. So, you know, once you get me started, I can go on yeah, forever. So, that's some good news. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think there is some here. Um, so let me see if I can make sure I get my screen sharing going on. And I've got some slides that uh, just sort of to provide some background. Um, this is the right one. Is that working? I think that should be working, hopefully. Um, Great. So, uh, so glad to speak with you today. Um, and I am passionate about this issue of church property. Uh, and just want to start off by saying I feel like we were on the cusp, maybe even in the middle of a um, of a staggering shift in the purpose and ownership of houses of worship around the United States. Um, that's going to change the very social fabric of our communities. Um, this shift has been accelerated by the effects of the pandemic, and using valuable assets owned by houses of worship thoughtfully and intentionally is vitally important, and it's an exciting opportunity. Um, the, the use of religious property, it's not just a question for religious institutions, but one that I think civic leaders um, need to consider and, and can, can be a part of, uh, uh, of um, helping to shape, actually. So just a little brief background, there's about 350,000 houses of worship in the United States estimated. No one actually really knows how many there are, but it's somewhere in that range. Um, about a quarter million buildings uh, associated with houses of worship. And the use and ownership of these properties is changing on an unprecedented scale. So research suggests that an estimated three and a half billion dollars of church property will change ownership in 2022 alone. And as many as 100,000 of these churches could close by 2025. The pandemic uh, has accelerated this trend that began decades ago. And this is a, a once in a many generation change, um, you might say, right? There's the shift in into purpose and ownership. It's not like they're going to go back there. This is a, a, a once, maybe not in forever, but once in a very long time uh, change that's upon us. Um, the scale of church closure and property reuse and sale is it's staggering. So this leads me um, to a question that honestly keeps me up at night sometimes, and that is what will happen in our communities as property that was previously owned by houses of worship becomes something different? So houses of worship are at least ostensibly there to serve the common good in some way. They provide services and space that support neighborhoods and communities. So I'm wondering where will the AA group meet, the Neighborhood Association, the Girl Scouts, when four out of six church buildings are gone, as is happening in some communities? Where will free meals be held? Where will overnight shelters be housed? What services will government entities have to take over as churches disappear? 
I was on a call actually just earlier this morning with a, um, a friend in San Antonio, Texas, who was talking about a rundown, small, tiny church that is providing enormous amount of services um, to immigrant populations in, in Texas as they arrive into San Antonio. Um, huge amounts of services being provided out of this very modest uh, space. And what happens to that kind of thing when churches um, aren't there or are repurposed? And then what of the massive shift in property wealth that will occur? So many churches are being sold to private developers. Um, not necessarily a bad thing, but as billions of dollars of property and land set up for social good becomes privately owned um, and becomes a form of wealth creation for a few individuals and companies, what will that do to the social fabric of our neighborhoods? Um, this changes here. And so my question is 20 years from now, what will we look back on and see um, has happened in, in our communities. What will be there in their place? Are there ways that we can encourage good things to emerge in their place? Um, and we kind of have one chance at this. Um, so what are we gonna do with it? But let me back up and tell you a story that relates to my own context uh, here in Madison, Wisconsin. A story about a young heroin addict who I will call uh, Peter. So it was the second time that Peter had relapsed in just a matter of months and one of countless times he had turned to heroin in the past few years. He had tried to quit for good and tried and tried, but the pull of a drug that takes the lives of more than 15,000 Americans each year was just too much. It didn't matter that he'd almost died of an overdose in the past. It didn't matter that his life had been derailed and he'd hurt many of the people who loved him most. It didn't even matter that he was back in school as a student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for the second time with a chance to finish and graduate. The draw of the drug was too strong, the disease too powerful. What more could he do? Was there any hope of escape? And what, if anything, could a church do to help? It turns out a lot. A church could do a lot. So Peter was living in a sober housing program run by Press House, the campus church where I serve as executive director, when this latest relapse occurred. He'd relapsed once in the program already, but this time, rather than write him off as a lost cause, our staff and the other residents held him accountable to the recovery plan that he'd put in place for himself and supported him through this latest setback. And this time it worked. With the help of his next step roommates and other resources, Peter moved deeper into his journey of recovery. He began to find success in school and make meaningful friendships on campus and hope was reborn for him. By the time Peter had graduated from college with a 3.5 GPA and a degree in computer engineering and taken a job at a well-known company, he'd also run a marathon and mended relationships with many of those he hurt while using heroin. He was a peer mentor in the Next Step program and an officer in the Campus Recovery Student Organization. And most importantly, he was sober. It turns out Peter's not the only one. 80% of the participants in the Next Step Sober Housing Program at Press House Apartments over the years have either graduated from degree programs, remain sober, or both. Just recently, the U.S. government released new statistics showing that more than 100,000 people died of a drug overdose last year. At a time when the opioid crisis is wrecking havoc on communities all over the country, this program has saved lives and it saved the people of Wisconsin almost a million dollars in costs associated with addiction. And at a moment when many houses of worship are struggling to figure out what role to play in our world, where fewer people attend services, but there's more what I call wicked problems that need our attention, Press House was truly there for Peter and his friends. What may be most remarkable about all of, remarkable about all of this is that Peter's life had been transformed by living in an apartment building that was built by a church on an underutilized church-owned parking lot, financed with an impact investment from a denominational endowment. And I know all this because I actually parked in that lot on my first day as a pastor. So I've been serving as pastor and executive director at Press House. Um, this is a, a, a drawing of it from many years ago. I've been serving here for about 18 years. When my spouse and co-pastor and I first arrived there, we were facing many of the same challenges that houses of worship are dealing with around the country, declining participation and shrinking funding. For us, it was pretty dire. After many years of decline, there were zero students involved in the program and a huge budget deficit that was only going to get worse. Our 90-year-old historic chapel building was falling apart around us. 
And we were asking the existential question that many are wrestling with. What does it mean to be a house of worship today? What do we have to offer our community? What really matters? This story highlights for me three pressing needs facing houses of worship and our communities today that thoughtful development can, uh, can actually help with. So first, many houses of worship are struggling to figure out how to fund their operation and mission. Participation and membership are in decline, which means budgets are shrinking even as costs of maintaining property rise. The financial model of the past, based on giving through an offering plate, is no longer sustainable in many settings. Some houses of worship will experiment with and, uh, and find new financial models. Others will have to sell or redevelop their property. In many neighborhoods, we may lament the decline of houses of worship or worry about decaying buildings. We may not want to see something else take their place, actually. But the reality is the tens of thousands of congregations simply cannot go on and will have to close, sell, or redevelop. That's just simply the reality that we're facing. Second, churches are trying to figure out what it means to even be a house of worship in our world today. While counting the number of people who show up for Sunday worship or Friday prayers is not really a great measure of impact, the decline in participation does indicate that more and more people are not connecting with what congregations have traditionally done or offered. So if the programs of the 1950s or 1980s are not engaging anymore, what is? What does it mean to be a transformative presence in a community today? The COVID-19 pandemic has brought this question to the fore even more starkly. For when a congregation is not meeting in person, what is it then and what should it be doing? Third, we are facing some very serious wicked problems in many of our communities. I'm sure those of you here gathered know much more about this than I do. And not wicked in the sense of evil, but wicked in the sense of complex and without simple solutions. Our neighborhoods are dealing with opioid addiction, food insecurity, a lack of living wage jobs, declining educational outcomes, the effects of climate change, and more. Very often, these problems are experienced in widely disparate ways, depending on one's racial ethnic identity or family wealth. Self-reflective congregations are taking notice of the fact that their buildings are often built on land stolen from indigenous people, and much of the founding wealth in historic denominations was extracted through slavery. So houses of worship are asking themselves, if the programs of the past aren't working, how do we be the church today in the midst of these systemic wicked problems we're dealing with now? All three of these realities, this need for new financial models, new expressions of mission, and ways to address deep wicked problems in our community, they converge on this question of repurposing and redeveloping church property. Thoughtful development has the potential to address all three of these realities in a sustainable and mission-focused manner. So the situation is not all doom and gloom, thankfully, far from it. As I mentioned in, or proclaim, I guess, in the title of my book, We Aren't Broke, houses of worship have enormous resources at their disposal to engage in thoughtful development. They know how to build community and connect people. They know how to do community organizing, even if that's not what they call it. Many are shrinking, but they are still rich with wonderful committed people that have a wide array of gifts and talents to offer. They draw upon beautiful centuries old traditions and have proven to be resilient during all manner of social change across the eras. And houses of worship have very valuable assets. We are not actually broke. Uh, houses of worship own a lot of capital, incredibly valuable property in A-plus locations in almost every village, town, and city in the United States. Houses of worship own a lot of buildings and massive endowments. In fact, the member organizations of the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility have more than $4 trillion of invested assets under management. That is T, trillion with a T. A single Christian denomination in North Carolina owns property estimated to be worth more than one and a half billion dollars. They are the second or third largest landholder in the entire state. And that is just the property of one denomination. Imagine if we added the value and acreage of the many traditions in the state. And this property is vastly underutilized. So leaders within that same North Carolina denominational network estimate that even before COVID, church property is in actual use only 12% of the week. That's in a Bible Belt state. The true utilization rate in many communities could be significantly lower. 
The opportunity to repurpose or redevelop even a fraction of this underutilized resource, it's simply staggering. Let me come back briefly to my story at Press House in Madison. When I first parked in our lot, the situation felt pretty bleak. There was no active program, very little funding, an aging building, an uncertain future. But Press House wasn't broke either. We had valuable property in the heart of a Big Ten university that we developed into a $17 million seven-story student housing facility that's now home to about 240 students each year. I lost my parking spot, which is definitely a shame in the Wisconsin winters, but the social enterprise um, generates more than $2 million per year in mission aligned funding and is a cornerstone of our ministry with university students. We now serve more than 800 students per year in a financially sustainable manner. This innovative use of church property is how that student Peter managed his heroin addiction and then graduated from college. Even while working with a population famous for not being interested in church, Press has been, has been able to engage thousands of students in just the past few years alone. Now, we do not proselytize students. We aren't seeking to convert them. Instead, we have found new ways to meet the real needs of students, from the opioid crisis, to student mental health, to racial tension on campus. While we hold worship services, those traditional church activities are not the primary place that we help promote the spiritual, emotional, intellectual growth of students. That's now happening in their living rooms throughout all aspects of their lives and virtually 24 seven. This was especially true during the pandemic when students had nowhere to go except their apartments. As we have experienced at Press House, property development has the potential to address root causes of wicked problems. With our housing, we are not just lightly touching on sobriety. We are providing a life-changing residential experience that gets to the very heart of addiction recovery. As many of you here know, um, building affordable housing has a similar potential to address a root cause of many social issues facing our communities. Houses of worship spend a lot of time, money, and energy working to meet the needs of people in our communities who live in substandard housing. A lack of quality affordable housing has a negative ripple effect throughout the community. When a child comes home from school to sleep in a car at night, as too many kids do, they're going to struggle to get their homework done and succeed in school. A Pew study found that when families pay too much for housing, they have less money left over to spend on their other needs, including food, clothing, childcare, and healthcare. If other income or housing options are unavailable, families are forced to make difficult trade-offs between those basic necessities to meet housing expenses. Through mission giving and volunteerism, many houses of worship work on issues of hunger, education, homelessness, and so on. Developing affordable housing has the potential to address not only those symptoms, but the underlying cause. Building affordable housing on property owned by houses of worship can be a game changer. And houses of worship have the means and the motivation and the property, usually unencumbered, to be that change. Housing isn't the only option for creative and socially beneficial uses of church property. Houses of worship are experimenting with neighborhood-owned grocery co-ops that address food deserts with community center models that provide space for nonprofit service agencies, with music performance spaces, bike shops, uh, co-working spaces, many other uses that are more financially viable and serve the social good. But the reality is these approaches are not always easy to create and houses of worship on their own will have a hard time making the new innovation happen without some help from government, philanthropic and business leaders. So I'm definitely not a public policy expert, and I'm actually really looking forward to the conversation we're about to have where you all can chime in. But I'm in the process of editing a new book called Gone for Good that has taken an interdisciplinary approach to the issues of church property transition, drawing from the expertise of developers, urban planners, sociologists, pastors, theologians, and others. And I'm learning from all of these different experts that there are some key steps that government and civic organizations can take to encourage the good development and repurposing of houses of worship. So I'm gonna share six ideas that keep coming up and I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on these. So here are some ideas that I keep hearing people saying. One is we need to plan for where we are headed. What I mean by this is that this transition is happening no matter what we want or what we kind of think. <laughs> And so I, I sort of liken it on a small scale to the climate change reality. Like this is happening. 
the, these churches are not, they're going somewhere. Things are changing. Um, for many years, churches and denominations have worked to change this trajectory to revitalize and to stem their decline. And in some specific instances, this has worked fine. But broadly speaking, it is now too late for that. In the same way that climate change is upon us, this wave of church closure is here. It is coming whether we want it to or not. I was part of a neighborhood meeting um, a, a number of weeks ago here in Madison uh, around the development of housing on a church property um, here in, in Madison. And it was fascinating to me um, to listen to some of the neighbors um, just frankly object to the idea that this church would be turned into housing because they lived across the street or whatnot. But I thought to myself, none of those neighbors objecting attend that church. None of them give any money to that church. They don't support it in any way. Um, they might object to it, uh, you know, on the face of not having this, this development in their neighborhood. But the thing is that church is going away one way or the other. So it doesn't really matter in a sense whether they object to it or whether they want don't want that change. It's going, it's happening. So the question is not so much is it happening, but what is going to be there in its place? That's why I titled this new book, Gone for Good. Gone for good as in gone forever and gone for good as in what is coming next. Is there something good coming next? One of the most helpful things, a second idea that I think municipalities and sort of government agencies can do is to, is to actually map the situation. So identify where church properties are. I mean, we don't even know that a lot of times in, in our community. Where are they? And understand how many are kind of on that trajectory towards closure or need to be redeveloped in the next five to 10 years. One of my biggest concerns in this whole issue that I've been noticing is that both church institutions and municipalities are approaching this issue in a very piecemeal manner, sort of one property at a time. And that was fine for a while when it was, was one property at a time. But now as is happening on a scale that's far greater than that, six out of eight in a community, for example, closing, um, we need to think a bit more strategically and, and sort of see the bigger picture and keep that in mind. I'll give you a couple examples. One, um, a number of years ago, uh, the denomination that I'm a part of sold a church in, uh, on the east side of Madison um, uh, to an Islamic community to, be, to become a mosque, which was a wonderful reuse of that property. Um, a really a great, a great reuse of that property. But then they took the proceeds from that sale and sort of just distributed it all over town. When what they could have done is use that as the seed of a, of a revolving loan fund, for example, to build affordable housing on another church property on the other side of town that has a great location and a whole lot of land. Um, so it's that kind of strategic thinking across, uh, across a community that I think we need. Another example is, um, is two churches here in Madison have decided to merge. Uh, and then one of them is uh, selling their property for housing. Um, and then they're taking the proceeds of that to actually redevelop the other church's property into um, truly affordable housing. That's the goal at least. So basically by selling one, they can then pull those resources and do something on the other property. So again, having a sort of a more comprehensive picture of what's going on I think is really important. Uh, and that's a role that um, municipalities could certainly play. Um, zoning, this is a, a huge thing. We could talk for days about zoning, I'm sure, um, and I'm not going to, but uh, zoning um, is, a, is a really big barrier um, sometimes for doing new sorts of development on church property. Often churches are located in prime locations to do high density affordable housing or to do a grocery store or whatnot but they can't because of zoning, right? And if they have to get special permission for each project, then most of those projects die at the neighborhood level. Um, I'm seeing this a lot in California. This is happening all the time there where there's this uh, developers, churches, they all have this great interest, even the city often actually in developing in some way, uh, low income or affordable housing, but then because it isn't zoned automatically for that, it dies um, at the neighborhood level and the neighborhood um, opposes it. So in California, there's 38,000 acres of religious owned property that is potentially developable. That's the size of the city of Stockton, California. Much of it is in high resource areas, much of it's near public transit, but there are no uniform land use rules, right? So the problems are around zoning, height restriction, density restriction, parking requirements. 
Um, a significant share of religious land, at least there, is zoned for single family use. Um, in Sacramento, California, two thirds of all religious owned land is zoned for single family use. So you can't build high density housing on that and that becomes a problem as soon as, as, soon as you try. So if addressing affordable housing shortage on church property is a goal, then we need to create a situation where the right kind of development can be done kind of by right rather than by exception. Uh, so looking at that as a zoning is a, is a really important um, consideration. Another one uh, from the sort of municipal side is services. So consider services and in some ways similar to zoning, access to the right level of services is sometimes a barrier for churches doing something new with their property. Obviously a, ch a church or property that was used for a couple hours on Sunday has a very different level of water usage, electricity need uh, and so on than a housing facility or a school or a grocery store. Um, and municipalities can review available services and plan ahead on the properties best suited for certain kinds of development. And again, that, that goes back to that issue of knowing where they are, knowing where they are in a neighborhood and knowing kind of what is going on and where it's headed um, in the next few years. Another one that's a little bit more um, sort of vague, but really important is balancing competing interests and desires. So many development decisions, they require this balancing of, of different interests, and that's especially true with new uses of church property. One balancing act that's vital to consider is between historic preservation and adaptive use. So many church buildings are, are historic, you know, historic buildings. They might be considered architectural gems. They might be even registered landmark buildings. Uh, my, my church, historic church building here in Madison is a, is a registered landmark building. And saving exemplary and beautiful architecture is important and valuable. But the problem with that is if such preservation makes it impossible to update those buildings for new uses, then we're gonna have a problem, right? Because what do we then do? Simply telling a church that they have to keep an aging building as it is exactly because it's a landmark, um, when there's not enough funding or no future business model, it's a lost cause, that's just not gonna work. You know, and what we might end up with is just fences up around empty buildings that just fall into disrepair and decay while there are landmarks and historic, but no other use can be, you know, no other use can be done in that property. Um, and that's a real shame. So I think it's better to proactively work on adaptive uses that retain as much of the historic character as possible, rather than insist on sort of perfection and preservation, only to have the building fall empty and into disrepair. Another balancing act, different, but another balancing act for municipalities that's, I think, really interesting and tricky, maybe, and is between generating tax revenues and, uh, and the social services and space that a church provides. So obviously, letting churches be acquired for for profit um, by for-profit developers for high-end housing, for example, which is happening, will increase property tax revenue, probably quite nicely. You can take an exempt property and generate quite a bit of revenue from that parcel if it becomes high-end housing. But what's then lost in that process, especially if it's done a lot, right? So then if, if many church properties become privatized and that social infrastructure is lost, municipalities may end up with new problems and actually higher costs to provide space and services that had previously been provided by churches. So just assuming that kind of developing it and increasing the tax base is a good idea, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a good assumption. It might end up actually being, especially over 10 years, 20 years, being really a problem. Community centers are increasingly important as places for residents to access services and gather in kind of third spaces. And churches often provide this sort of space, or they could um, if they were sort of updated and repurposed. But if they're sold off as private development, then that option is gone. And there's no way really to retrieve very easily privately owned you know, land at that point back into, um, into public good. It's much more difficult than starting with what's already there. So new revenues could be more than offset by new costs or lost services. This is another one of the balances, I think, uh, to keep in mind. Finally, um, funding. Funding is a major challenge for more creative, socially oriented projects from affordable housing to childcare to grocery co-ops and other activities. So catalytic capital is needed, right? Capital that is patient, 
not seeking market rate returns and willing to accept higher risk in order to facilitate innovation and social good. That's just the way this is going to have to be. There's going to have to be capital that is, if not purely philanthropic, at least less than market rate um, in, its, uh, in its seeking of, uh, of return. This might be in the form of grants or low interest um, investment or technical assistance in obtaining favorable financing. Um, there are options for uh, municipal bond financing, depending on how things are structured. Like there's a, but, but some of these things are quite technical and complicated. And so municipalities can assist with providing um, funding, if not directly, then assisting churches in securing such funding or making mechanisms available for that or providing seed funding to get started or initial grants to get going, pre-development funding. All of those sorts of things are gonna be critical for this to happen on a, on a big scale. Again, so many of these churches are in a really difficult spot. I was working with a church in Cal California last week uh, in the San Jose area in Silicon Valley, has 20 members left. And uh, most of them are really kind of tired and worn out, um, but they have this incredible property right in the heart of Silicon Valley that could be put to amazing use. But they're, they're really struggling and they're right on that edge of just sort of walking away and just saying they're going to, you know, put a sign up for, for sale and, and walk away, which would be a shame because then the opportunity to do something new and unique is sort of lost. But there's help is needed, essentially, right? So encouraging both through all these different ideas that I've just shared here and, and others that we might come up with, um, helping them to do that. So in closing, uh, there are a lot of challenges, obviously, before us. There's a lot of need. Um, this this change, this transition is happening no matter what. Um, but we're not broke. The opportunity is great. Um, there's really no better time in some ways to dream big and take some risks and to try to do some new things with these properties. Um, the needs are great. The opportunities are even greater. And there are resources there. And we're at a moment when, when we can and houses of, worship, houses of Worship can sort of sit on the sidelines and watch this work happening around us or just sort of let it unfold. Um, as it fades into the background, or we can jump in and, and lead and, and actually encourage some of these things uh, to become new and good, um, meaningful um, options for, for our neighborhoods and for our communities. So I'll stop there and uh, look forward to some conversation. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Um, I do see a few folks, um, that have raised their hand. Uh, so if uh, Vice Chair, if you didn't have any uh, comments, I'll, I'll go straight to the questions if that's okay with you. Okay, I don't... By all means, let's go. Okay, let's go great, to okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Howard, and then I'll go to Commissioner Guajardo. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mark, I got to give you an award for the cleanest, crisp presentation of fewest words, most impact. And I love the images that you put forth. It's a lesson for a lot of meetings I've been sitting through over the past couple of years to have uh, it directed toward your conversation with us rather than just reading a slide. So first of all, thank you. Uh, my question is the work that you've done at the macro level is exceptional, but uh, many of us here, you know, we're interested in the uh, kind of things all come down to local. And I was wondering what you know about the houses of worship within either Cook County or the city of Chicago, uh, more specifically, you know, so that we who deal with policy issues locally, um, are there any trends that you've seen within the north um, east region of our state? Yeah, so Full disclosure, I don't know any detail about your area specifically, although I actually was born in the suburbs of Chicago, but I don't know anything about the churches in your area specifically. Um, but I will, I am confident that the trends that I shared are exactly the same ones going on in your in your neighborhood because they're happening everywhere. Um, if I may, so if I may uh, add to that, uh, Howard, I, I endorse what you're saying. It is a very useful and compelling presentation. And Mark has very graciously agreed to collaborate with the commission in seeking to identify 
uh, specific opportunities that we might incubate and perhaps uh, present to the county board as ordinance or uh, actionable policy. And uh, so, Mark, thank you for that too. I think you've kind of laid the, the groundwork here, uh, but I think you've certainly piqued the interest of lots of commissioners and I see many still have questions and I, I very much appreciate your willingness to collaborate with us going forward. So, um, Madam Chair, if you would like to call on others who have questions, I think that's a Sure thing. So we have on queue uh, Commissioner Guajardo and then Commissioner Malone. Hi, thank you for thank you for all the information. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I actually have a few questions, so if I would be please allowed to to follow up questions um, as I'm hearing him. Um, so a few things that come to mind. I love the idea in terms of redevelopment, um, utilizing the the vacant buildings. I actually think that that should be done with other properties as well. But I guess I'm not fully understanding what exactly you're asking for. I did hear your points in terms of the zoning and all these other stuff, but I, I'm not sure what the commission can do, one, and then I'm still trying to visualize it. Who will carry this on to make it effective? Yes, good, qu <laughs> good question. Um, uh, I don't know the answer to that either in the sense. I, and I guess what I'm hoping is by sharing this information and this idea, you all will be able to continue to generate on that and think about that and what that is. I, to me, this sort of thing is going to require partnership. Uh, there's no question about it. It will require both civic and private and church partnerships um, to make them work. Um, none of them will happen on their own. And so my recommendation, you know, one recommendation, I guess, is to, to if you're interested in pursuing some of these conversations, is to talk to some of the denominational leaders probably um, in your areas. So from the various uh, Catholic leaders and then the various Protestant denominational leaders who will have some idea and some sense of what's going on in their churches um, around uh, to sort of see what is really needed, like what help do they need and what, where are the sticking yeah. points? Yeah, yeah. We have, so in the Southeast side of Chicago, um, about five, I believe, of our churches closed. So the Archdiocese of Chicago decided to close all these churches, which is very unfortunate. And only two um, are fully, two or three are fully up. Um, but I, but yeah, I would love to actually entertain a further conversation regarding this because I feel like it's not just the churches, spaces that are also needed to redevelop, but also all these vacant properties that are in our communities, in particular like Latino African American communities um, in marginalized um, areas of the city of Chicago as well as the South suburbs. So. Thank you for that. And, um, but yeah, so I'm just trying to understand how this could actually work further. Thanks. And I can partly uh, answer that, uh, Commissioner Guajardo, because I think that the, the, what Mark presented to us is exactly what we need to be looking into, right? There's these questions about, you know, how do we plan for, for, for what's going to happen? And also, you know, Mark, you, you highlighted how do we map the situation? How do we do the research? How do we understand? with the current uh, uh, local, to, to Howard's point, the local situation is, and then look at these barriers that may ex exist. Um, I know, uh, Commissioner Guajardo, you mentioned a very uh, interesting also part of the, the city of Chicago that has been seeing a lot of uh, disinvestment overall, including with the churches. Um, I know that a lot of the, some of those churches were churches where my family went to, and all of a sudden they were consolidated and the buildings are now empty. Um, they are not being utilized, but they're gorgeous buildings and they could have a lot of impactful things. And I know, for example, um, uh, CTU, uh, uh, the Centros de Trabajadores Unidos would utilize some of the spaces, like for example, St. George, uh, Commissioner Guajardo um, in the basement. So that they're definitely areas where they can be community centers or provide other social services. So what we, what, I think what Mark is presenting us is how do we analyze it and bring it locally and really look at this as an opportunity um, to do some investment and also bring back these resources to the community so that there's no void in the services that were provided by uh, religious institutions. Um, uh, so we have now with their hand uh, raised Commissioner Malone, Commissioner Flores and Commissioner Yonan. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for coming to present. I'm super excited. Um, there's there for, to answer some of the questions that folks are asking. There has been some work on churches of the future in the city of Chicago, and I'm just going to 
drop that information in the chat so you have the, the deck. But essentially, the work that we've thought of right now and contemplated in the city, starting with some of the work in Rogers Park, was on adaptive reuse of existing churches and how to find places, you know, as opposed to like, okay, the real estate's empty now, what are we going to do and giving away? It was more of like, okay, if you're currently running a church, but you're underutilized, can you do this or a internet service, a daycare or whatever, whatever, right? And so uh, when I think about where the commission could possibly help, um, you know, in, in my community of Inglewood, we have 357 religious faith-based organizations. Uh, we are eight and a half square mile community, uh, third largest in the city of Chicago. And um, we don't know what to do with all this stuff, but they don't have, I mean, you know, the average church has a small congregation anyway. Um, and so, a couple of things come to mind, a conversation maybe with the Cook County Land Bank Authority um, and what a strategy would be looking at those uh, properties. I think there's also probably a conversation to be had with the assessor's office, um, considering that so many, or, or even procurement, considering that so many faith-based organizations are tax exempt, uh, so many of them also haven't done that with the real estate they stand on. And so there's like a mix of like, some churches and faith-based organizations paying taxes and some not. Um, and then there's also uh, a conversation probably to be had with um, either procurement or someone about um, financial incentives, whether that's tax breaks and tax incentives or otherwise for community developers who want to repurpose parcels with vacant um, churches or, or faith-based facilities. So I think there are probably a number of ways that the county can get involved or at least set the precedent and the tone for how the city can get involved once the county has uh, kind of laid that path out. But right now, uh, financial incentives for faith-based facility redevelopment um, and maybe a, a program with the land bank are the first things that come to mind for me. Uh, but I am wondering in your area, um, have you all already designed or defined either policy solutions or public sector financial solutions that can help? We have some organizations here in town that also do asset mapping. So um, being able to figure out who the faith-based organizations are, um, we have some partners that come to mind, but I'd be curious to know uh, where you are kind of if anything has been implemented on the policy side yet. Uh, not enough. <laughs> Probably the answer I would say. I mean, I think there, there's a, honestly a, just a kind of a growing, dawning awareness that this is happening on, at a level that needs policy. I mean, truthfully, there's been such a kind of hands-off approach, I think, to houses of worship for, from, from municipalities for so long, which is partly just a function of our, you know, church and state and all of that, which is fine. But because of that, there's like, you just, they just do their thing over here and we don't, we don't mess with them. We don't, <laughs> do we don't really help them we don't really do anything with them it just sort of happens and I guess part of my message is that that I don't think is going to work anymore as you know to some extent as this transition happens quickly um and so many of these church religious institutions are very fragile they're just so fragile you know it's like yes they could come up with these ideas they could do these things but they actually can't they just don't even have the capacity and leadership the capacity and finance and so on to do it and so some way of supporting that whatever those ideas are even convening i mean your idea of kind of bringing people together is a really interesting one sort of a convening playing a convening role connecting different organizations with each other other nonprofits maybe that might actually be able to support houses of worship or operate out of houses of worship, you know, looking for space. I mean, those are all really interesting ideas um, that I think have some promise. But but yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be done on the policy side and to really dig into what would help, um, you know, and it varies. So it's so locally based, obviously, like what that means. Um, and, and it's partly why I highlighted the zoning questions, because some of those are, you know, kind of policy related things that, that may have that, that would have an impact but. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Flores? Thank you, Commissioner Naya, and um, thank you for bringing Mark to present today, because I think it's, um, it's a great time to have this discussion. And really, I think this commission itself is, is the right avenue to convene, um, because as part of this commission, we're looking at 
policy and trying to figure out how we can be a, a connector, a collaborator in order to get some of these um, ideas and different entities coming together to advance some of these interesting um, initiatives. In particular, though, this this topic has been something that within the county um, we've been exploring and talking about. So it's a, it's a great time to link the social innovation work and the work of the county um, around this. So we have had discussions um, with the Cook County Land Bank as well. So I think that a convening with individuals from the social innovation and Mark, this would be an opportune time for us to just brainstorm ideas. I, I love having your background, your expertise at the table to help us think through opportunities. So I very much welcome that and I could definitely pull in other partners from the county to be part of those discussions. Great, Commissioner Flores. I know that uh, uh, myself and Vice Chair Lane, we're trying to set up a meeting with the land bank to talk about some of these issues. Maybe if you can help facilitate that, um, that would be a great next step for us to start in, in, in continuing the conversation. I know due to OMA, we have to just, you know, be careful with how many members are a part of the, of, of the conversation. But I know uh, Vice Chair Lane um, is very interested in looping in um, the land bank because we've had multiple conversations and I feel like this is, this is a continuation of also how do we involve the land bank? How do we uh, partner up? And how do we support and elevate the efforts that they're doing um, in conjunction with the solutions that are being presented? Uh, we know that uh, Cook County is is in in such a time where we have a lot of that work uh, ahead of us. But we, uh, the beauty of it is that it looks like you know we're all trying to pull in the same direction, and we all know that there's um, some work to be done. So that would definitely be a great next step if uh, if you can help us. Uh, yes convene that meeting. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Chairman and I, if I may say, uh, I, I had a relevant conversation with the executive director of the land bank recently, and uh, what she is focusing on, and she wants to work with us as to this issue, which I think is connected, is not only looking at the operations of the land bank, which of course has been subject to some controversy, uh, but rather look to the uh, foundational problems that lead to the necessity of the land bank in the first instance. You know, what, people are not, uh, you know, declining to pay their real estate taxes by choice. You know, these are fundamental issues that relate, to, uh, as many of our social problems do, to the many faces of poverty. And uh, so if we kind of loop the, the religious community into that conversation, I think we can get kind of a, a double benefit out of that. On the one hand, we're looking at uh, underutilized land in many cases that can be monetized for the public good, but put to work for the public good in any event. And secondly, I think there is kind of a faith component to some of these considerations as well. Uh, so I think if we can kind of look at that through both of those lenses, that might be of some utility. Great, thank you, Vice Chair, for that update. That definitely sounds exciting. Um, and I'm glad that uh, we were able to start that conversation and making those connections, uh, though that's important. Um, Commissioner Yonan and followed by Commissioner Cooley, please. Yeah, again, Mark, thank you for your presentation and Madam Chair, you know, the one thing that, you know, I could have just maybe bring a little bit to the table on this conversation is, uh, you know, I'm part of the uh, uh, kind of in the county's unit of, of government responsible for the assets that um, the county owns and in also kind of the space of, of where our 17 commissioners look to try to lease space for their district offices. And so one of the things I know is a challenging from the government side is there's a little bit of a political risk that's associated with where some of these, you know, offices might be, um, should that space, you know, for instance, be owned by a particular someone? And is that someone gonna, you know, kind of go through some kind of vetting process? Should we, you know, rent offices where maybe there isn't the, the worries of certain taxes? But all that to say the complications of some things on this end, maybe this, you know, commission could kind of help to demystify some of that, because it's not only 17 commissioners here at Cook County, that have those field offices, and in some cases, maybe more than one office that will execute a lease um, right after the election here going into early next year, 
where we'll probably have 17 new leases. But in many instances, the county commissioners will also, you know, partner with local aldermen, state senators, state representatives. So if there's some way within the government structure here where we can kind of have a more, you know, vetted, you know, way of, of, of maybe kind of allowing there to be less of that political risk, there might be some great conversations to be had. And I'll definitely sign up on any way I can help on that, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Yonan. Perfect timing, right? Like you mentioned, uh, a lot of new leases coming up uh, in the next few months. So absolutely really good time to be looking at this and seeing how we can leverage again some of the, the assets and also partnerships. So thank you for pointing that out. Commissioner Cooley. Yeah, thank you. Um, Excited to hear about this prospect. Uh, my parents were retired pastors and went through the declining aging population of an older church in um, a smaller city in central Florida and know that that was a huge, that they were, you know, running a ton of social service programs, but there was just no active planning from, you know, and it's very difficult for a small congregation that's like dealing with, you know, pent up hundreds of thousands of dollars of capital. Um, that has to be renewed, um, but without kind of having that kind of earlier warning process. And I know we've talked in historic meetings here about, you know, warnings for small businesses when there's an owner who's aging out and making sure that we're fine, you know, trying to find systems to get new owners or worker cooperatives or employee owned options, but wondering the same with either the diocese, the diocese um, other regional synods, presbyteries who, you know, could have a pulse on what's going on in each congregation and could be part of that process for saying they're in this kind of danger zone before they get tip over, before it's impossible to come up with something creative. As you mentioned, there's a lot of planning and engagement that needs to take place. Um, but also highlighting that the county, or at least with Cook County Public Health, who we're partnering with, is doing a lot of work with some ARPA resources to be looking at community assets, especially around of health issues, but also feeding issues. Um, but thinking of these spaces as also, you know, some have industrial scale kitchens that are these valuable assets that could be put to use for commercial use and um, other creative feeding programs, job training opportunities that the land can be used for, as you mentioned, farming and other resources. It's, you know, potential green space that could be activated in a more community-based way, but also has environmental benefits. So really excited for thinking about how um, all of these things can be stitched together. Great, thank you for pointing those out, uh, Commissioner Cooley, appreciate that. Um, so I know that we have another presentation, so I'll uh, hand it over to our Vice Chair uh, Lane for any closing comments, uh, next steps in regards to Mark's presentation, and then we can move on to yeah, thank uh, our you, second. Commissioner Nye. And again, I would, uh, Mark, I, I needn't reiterate uh, that the commission is extraordinarily enthusiastic about your, your ideas. Uh, and the, as you and I had discussed, and as the commission is aware, uh, we, we tend to incubate actionable social policy recommendations uh, through working groups that are created based upon the interest and expertise of commissioners. So I would, and I've heard a number of the commissioners already volunteer to be helpful in driving this agenda. So I would ask that any uh, of the commissioners who is specifically interested in uh, either leading or working on uh, a working group we might create around this initiative, please reach out to me and I'll assemble those folks and uh, be happy to attend those meetings and be supportive of whatever it is the working group and ultimately the commission elects to do. But Mark, I would like to uh, thank you, uh, congratulate you again on your leadership uh, we see the commission's role, not only in terms of what is to be done in Cook County, but how we can see those ideas scale up and roll out nationally, even globally. So we have a common objective in terms of leveraging thought leadership, and uh, you are a thought leader who is inspiring us and empowering us. So thanks for being with us. And if you want to stick around for the balance of the meeting, uh, you would be uh, most uh, enthusiastically welcome to do that. And uh, otherwise, we, we very much appreciate your, your time today and what you do every day. So thank you. 
you. It's been good to be with you all. I probably will step off, but it's been wonderful to spend this time with you and all the best. I will connect with you then offline and, and thanks again. Um, so uh, thank you. Interestingly, and, and perhaps not so coincidentally, uh, we have a, a, a presentation next by Commissioner De Laurentiis, uh, whom many of you know is the executive director of the South Suburban Mayors and Managers Association. And she and her organization have been working on now for a number of, for a substantial period of time on what has come to be known as the Southland Reactivation Act. And among other things, it is intended to create a model in uh, the Southland for municipalities to uh, take tax exempt parcels and bring them back onto the tax rolls, uh, not only generating property tax revenue to taxing bodies, but also revitalizing blighted communities. And I see this as really as a logical extension of the conversation just concluded. So uh, Commissioner De Laurentiis, I would uh, welcome your comments on the status of where things uh, uh, stand and how the commission or the commissioners for that matter uh, might be helpful in getting you across the goal line. Sure, thank you so much. So we're, we're very, very close. I have a couple of slides if I could share my screen. If that doesn't work, I can just give you a, a quick up to date summary of where we're at. Uh, let me know if, if I can share my screen. You should be able to, Talia, if you can just. Um, okay, I've got yeah, it. I'm, I'm in her co host. Yeah. Great. Should there be you able to see. do it. Okay, let me know if you can see it. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, the Southland Reactivation Act, as many of you may recall, was brought to this body uh, when we were in person. So it's been at least two and a half years ago, but uh, Jay Reddy, who was working with the South Suburban Economic Growth Initiative and I presented to this body, we were very enthusiastically uh, received with this initiative because I, I believe many of you understood why this may be applicable to the Southland at this moment but it really could serve as a redevelopment tool for other areas. So this it was a proposal of South Suburban mayors and managers to get tax exempt parcels back on the tax rolls, uh, bringing new dollars uh, to uh, all the taxing bodies. We proposed it for our hardest hit uh, townships in our area that were substantially the same as the counties, uh, as Cook County's class eight, uh, areas that had been identified as exceedingly, extraordinarily uh, distressed back in the 80s. And um, I will tell you that conditions have actually worsened since then. We developed uh, a specific criteria that must be met uh, for properties to be considered by municipalities as, as reactivation designation sites. But the goal would be to lower the property tax bills for these sites for 12 years and essentially at a significant enough rate uh, with a um, uh, diminishing tax abatement over 12 years. So essentially a step increase every year. And we were sort of um, using this strategy about needing a tool to help us build back better uh, early in the days of COVID when our area was significantly impacted. And I just want to sh share a couple of slides. These are actual properties within communities that are uh, zoned. This, this uh, tool for us is uh, limited to commercial industrial properties. And these are some actual properties that are currently held that municipalities have acquired, just acquired, often through no cash, you know, no cash bids, scavenger sales, et cetera. And then they're uh, tasked with stabilizing them, secure, securing them and trying to turn them around. In the South suburbs, many of you know, we have the highest tax rates in the, um, in the state essentially, and often in the entire country. Uh, some of our communities are pushing 40% tax rates, which is a comparison to Chicago, which is uh, under you know, 6.8. So you can just see the difference and really it's impacting uh, investor interest in our area. This is the city of Harvey has many, you know, has a, has a very storied past. 
uh, both as a successful majority uh, black community, but really have, has fallen on hard times. And um, some of these properties are this, the one on the left here is actually a, a, across the street from a train station. So it would be served by transit. It should be marketable. Uh, they need a lot of investment to bring them up to par or demolition and starting over. And the cost is an impediment to investors. I also just want to mention that it, uh, when uh, Assessor Pappas or Treasurer Pappas uh, posted her scavenger sale uh, with a list of properties, more than half of those pins that were identified were in the South Suburbs. And when we look at how many properties are currently tax exempt, this is uh, across the board, including places of worship, chur churches, uh, schools, all kinds of uh, tax exempt uh, designation. We have over 17,000 pins alone, let alone you know the, the uh, thousands of residential and commercial industrial parcels that are tax exempt because municipalities have acquired them to try to, to try to gain control and get them back on the tax tax rolls. So the pilot uh, is limited to six townships, again owned by muni the municipal municipalities or land bank held properties that are often done in concert with municipalities. So the land banks also have an opportunity to help uh, transition these properties, get them back on the tax rolls, but they cannot do it without the support of the municipalities. They can't act independent of municipalities. And um, we, uh, you know, we've talked to them and really developed a strategy about how to do this in concert because the goals are universal about trying to get properties uh, back in the hands of end users uh, in, in um, uh, especially the long languishing commercial and industrial pars uh, parcels that have an inherent amount of risk in them because they've been, because of the, um, you know, historic use of the property, how long they've been vacant uh, and um, just the infrastructure that's needed. So uh, we have uh, put in a pretty rigorous criteria in order to uh, successfully navigate Springfield and really, you know, their concern about how wide use this could be, how many parcels we're looking at. I will tell you that uh, we've identified about 1,800 within the six townships as, as it stands now. Many of them are, uh, have been off the tax rolls for, for more than a decade. So we are uh, you know, actively looking at those and thinking, what were the impediments that caused uh, no interest in, you know, in investors to come back into this area? And often, again, it comes down to, to uh, the tax bill. I will tell you that uh, because, of, because of the work that we've done over the last couple of years, we've had strong champions, both in the House and the Senate. Um, Senator uh, uh, Patrick Joyce uh, just recently helped navigate the bill through the Senate State Government Committee. And the legislative process uh, included uh, a robust uh, House, House uh, Revenue and Finance Committee. And what's really interesting is that when we were talking to legislators across the state uh, within the various committees, they were remarking that it was uh, proposed as a pilot for the South Suburbs universally could be used in you know, regions around the, around the state. And uh, you know, there was this uh, expression uh, to us that was very rewarding, I would say, when they were saying, get this passed, get this up and running, show us how to do it and let us uh, model after your success. So we have um, passed through the House uh, successfully last week, 106 to six. Uh, we uh, went through the State Senate Government Committee earlier this week. We are waiting for a concurrence vote on the bill and uh, we are expecting to have that either late tonight or sometime tomorrow. And if we don't, we'll be heartbroken because we'll have to wait till veto session. Uh, we really are anticipating because of the broad support that we had for this bill that we'll be uh, successful to, you know, in the, tomorrow. And then the hard work begins. 
we've already uh, reached out and started to work with both of the, the land banks, the South Suburban Land Bank Development Authority, the Cook County Land Bank Executive Director and said, you know, help us strategize and make sure that we have the roadmap for implementation. So that's what SSMMA is gonna be focusing on uh, if the bill passes tomorrow between now and when the governor actually signs it into law. I wanna just express my appreciation for the, the initial support when we brought this a couple of years ago, because you really provided um, great insight to us and input. And I think the, um, the momentum for us to say, yeah, I think, you know, I think we've got a gem here in legislation that fixes a problem that we haven't been able to do uh, just by, um, you know, sort of group think about how do we take care of some of these properties. You know, we've had a lot of meetings. We've, we've often met and strategized about languishing property values, the decline in value, the challenge that we have, the creation of a land bank. Um, you may not know this, but SSMMA was instrumental in creating a land bank that could help us facilitate uh, transitions of abandoned property and Cook County Land Bank was modeled after ours. So we were the first in the state. So we recognized this uh, and in fact created the first land bank in 2012. So we knew this was a problem. We finally said, we have to help ourselves, but we need legislation to do it. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has, um, but right now, fingers crossed that we'll get across the finish line tomorrow and have some real stories to tell you in the coming months. Christine, SB 3189, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And uh, I, for one, am very supportive of what you're doing. And I think uh, it, when you call this a pilot, I think this will become a model and uh, used throughout the areas of the state that can benefit from it. So thank you for, for bringing this forward and for your tenacity and discipline and <laughs> bringing it uh, across the finish line. And we'll, we're rooting for you. Thank you, thank you. I will tell you in terms of the pilot, we're, we're really excited about it. One of the things that we will be doing is reporting to the General Assembly and to other taxing districts, sort of what's happening on the ground, how many jobs, we've got kind of a whole list of uh, criteria that we're gonna be uh, reporting on. So internally in my organization, we're setting up the systems uh, so that we can monitor this and really have this information at our fingertips when we need it. So. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about the opportunity because beyond just kind of putting non-productive properties back on the tax rolls, we see it as an opportunity for community building and jobs at the local level and growth and, um, you know, school funding. I mean, you name it, we, we think this uh, initiative uh, will serve us well. Well, well all, all the best. And this is... Uh... This is part of the economic recovery that we need. So good luck with that and uh, wish you well. Thank you. Christy, it's Howard. I wanna make sure that you know, uh, when you get the good news, we have a EDAC meeting coming up uh, later this month. And I'd like to make that announcement or have you make that announcement at the full EDAC meeting. In, well, you're invited. Thank you. Well, we're, we're, tr we're trying to, we'll, we'll try to get it done. That's all I can say. I think Patrick has a question. Commissioner Brutus. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Commissioner De Laurentiis, uh, I congratulate you on the vision for this, um, for this, I don't know, this is huge, um, for this uh, proposal here to really, you know, assemble and marshal all the forces of the the member organizations and in, 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 uh, municipalities in the SSM MMA. Um, I think people, you know, when you say the gravity of underutilized parcels of 17,000 in, in your service area, that is so huge. And that really, um, I think, gets to the heart of the economic uh, condition of the South suburbs. And, you know, for that, these innovative uh, solutions are exactly what's needed uh, in the South suburbs. I am originally from University Park. Uh, I live in the city now, but I, you know, I do my best to try and maintain awareness of what's going on in my uh, home region. And uh, I just thank you for your leadership. Uh, I know you've been at this for a while. And so I just wanted to congratulate you publicly here on this um, 
at this uh, earliest opportunity uh, to do so. And I, I know you're gonna get a successful passage uh, later tonight or tomorrow morning. And so I congratulate you on your hard work and the leadership of you know leading all these municipalities out in the South suburbs. Congratulations. Thank you, really yes. appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner Brutus. Any other questions by any of the other members? Yes, Commissioner, I, I just oh, had a quick one around what was the bill number again? <laughs> Uh, it was Senate Bill 3189, House Amendment 1. So it was, um, sorry, are you in there for the noise for the background? Uh, before I uh, uh, close my speaker, I do want to recognize uh, Mayor Ellsbury, who is uh, with the Village of Hazelcrest, has been very instrumental in, in, in advancing this initiative with us as well. So he's been in the trenches from day one as we've been strategizing with mayors across the region on how to get it done, how to, uh, you know, what's what's at stake for the municipalities, so. Well, thanks to Mayor Ellsbury as well. Uh, his leadership is uh, second to none, or maybe few, but maybe none. And uh, thank you so much for Mayor for all you do, and this being one, one example among many. Um, I think that uh, brings us to uh, the committee reports of the, uh, or, or more accurately, the working group reports, I believe. Um, I, I, I may be corrected on this, but I do not believe that uh, we have an official report from either of the working groups. Am I to be corrected on that? Is there some, are any of the commissioners speaking to that? If, if not, I will give you what I know about it. There are some extraordinary, circumstances here that prevent the leadership of the two working groups not to be here all at the same time. But I, I, I do want to kind of let you know that uh, we have two working groups, as you'll recall. Um, the first is dealing with the notion of creating and promoting uh, diverse talent pipelines for the construction trades, but ultimately more broadly than that. And uh, we're working with the Obama Foundation on that specifically. Uh, you'll recall that uh, Michael Stradmanis spoke with us. He's uh, vice president of the foundation uh, in charge of community engagement initiatives. He has assigned first one and now a second person to collaborate with us. Uh, they have been extraordinarily busy in trying to get the building up for the presidential center. You may know that presidential, President Obama was in town this week. Uh, so that helps to explain that uh, you'll have a more fulsome report next month, but uh, not in any way to um, minimize the uh, strong effort and time commitment and talent of those who are working on that group. And you'll, you'll see some very significant efforts there. Uh, similarly, uh, the other working group, which uh, is focused on community investment vehicles in concert with Chicago Community Trust, Mercy Corps and others. Uh, we, there, there have been several meetings. I've attended each of them, I believe. And um, we've come to a point where uh, without violating the terms of the Open Meetings Act, uh, leadership of the working group and I would like to meet with Chair Anaya to start working through some of the logistics issues associated with getting specific proposals in front of the county board, because we are you know, subject to the approval of the commission, which uh, we hope will be invited and secured in the fairly near term. We wanted to start working through the uh, procedural elements of getting where we need to go, because the recommendations as they're being preliminarily developed uh, have a, a number of uh, interesting, uh, some might say challenges, I will say opportunities attached to them. And uh, so, uh, Commissioner and I, with your permission, will set up a conversation uh, along those lines, hopefully in the very uh, near term. And uh, otherwise, I think that constitutes the sum and substance of the two working group reports and uh, happy to be the messenger. But uh, I don't want you in any way to construe this as in lieu of people who are working really hard on this day in and day out, and they are. And I think you'll see those results in very short order. Thank you so much, Vice Chair. And yes, I, we, we understand that the leaders of the uh, 
ad hoc committees um, had some a few emergencies were not able to join us today, but thank you so much for summarizing and I'd be more than happy to uh, uh, to join you um, in in a, in a conversation, a meeting to see the next steps. Um, it's uh, fairly uh, exciting to see uh, things have such quick turnarounds. Uh, typically, you know, sometimes in, uh, we, we wait a little bit longer, but this is great that it's moving along and the conversations are so fruitful that there's already proposals coming up. So well, thank you. Are, and I, can, I commend is, you, this, Vice Chair, for taking it, such great leadership of that. It, it may be a, a short time in terms of uh, weeks, but it's not a short time in terms of hours. So oh, <laughs> I, I can see that absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you for much. your time and the dedication, and of course to to our fellow uh, commissioners of the commission for for being so willing to to donate additional time and resources and uh, research uh, opportunities to to the commission. So I believe that those were the only things on our end. Um, so uh, if there's no announcements or any other matters that would uh, that members would like to bring forward, I will entertain a motion uh, to adjourn. If that's okay with the vice chair, is that just, is that just accurate? Very briefly, just very briefly, sure. and I'll say this in one sentence. A couple of the commissioners have already reached out to me about uh, serving on a working group around Mark Elston's uh, proposal today. If you would be so kind as to send me an email and let me know specifically you know, what area of interest you have and how we might start to structure the working group, that would be, that would be very helpful and I would appreciate that. And, and thank you for your leadership, uh, Chairman and I, I think we're, I think the commission is really uh, gaining traction and it's uh, uh, in no small measure to your leadership and thank you for that. Great. Thank you. Um, so yes, please reach out to the vice chairman via email um, if you are interested in joining any of the ad hoc committees um, and yeah, we'll keep everyone uh, in the loop uh, in the next meeting as we continue to have conversations and bring forward um, idea solutions and uh, proposals. Um, so again, I, I, I don't see any hands. Um, if there's anybody, I don't see any. So, okay, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the committee. So moved. So moved. moved by Commissioner Brutus, second, second by in. Commissioner Caliente, Caliento. Um, uh, not debatable, so uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And thanks, aye. everybody. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Bye bye.